Hello! So today I'm going to be reviewing The Whale by Chum Wong Kwan. A little precursor to today's review, I'm going to be butchering some names. I'm going to be butchering them real good. And for that I can only ask for your forgiveness, but my dyslexic brain is trying. Originally written in 2004 and newly translated, this is the second book from the International Booker shortlist that I've read, the first being Time Shelter, which I really enjoyed. Now reactions to this book have been mixed to say the least. Some reviewers haven't even made it past the first 100 pages. Some reviewers have found it a very mixed bag and some have loved it. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Allow me to just switch into hyperbolic Andy mode. This is the best book I've read this year without a doubt. And I've been doing some thinking. I've been thinking real hard. And I think this is one of the best books I've read in the past three years, maybe longer. Now I might have some recency bias going on there, so I'm gonna need to let it sit for a little while, but my lord, I loved, loved this book. It's a satire full of folklore, magical realism, absurdism, surrealism, all the isms. And this book is brutal. And I mean brutal. Well, not bizarro horror brutal, obviously not that brutal, it's on the International Booker list, but for a book on the International Booker list, yeah, it's pretty brutal. But alongside all that brutality, this is also a very, very funny satire of 20th century South Korea, and it is also incredibly sad as well. Chum Wong Kwan has thrown everything, including the kitchen sink, into this novel. Did I mention it was brutal? And honestly, I am not surprised people have stopped reading this by the 100 page mark. The first 50 pages alone has multiple rapes, paedophilic abuse, murder, incest, and very detailed descriptions of a young adolescent boy with a massive penis. So big that it makes one of our main characters, upon seeing it, instantly wet themselves. We also have an elephant called Jumbo who can talk to a young girl in her mind, a mute woman with the strength of 20 men, a woman with one eye and one arm who seems to be able to control bees, a movie theatre created in the shape of a whale, and much, so much more. That is just the tip of the iceberg. If you stopped reading before the 100 page mark, then yes, the violence towards women is vast, but keep reading because the violence towards everyone is vast. No one is off the hook in this book. I can see it being a turn off for quite a lot of readers, the violence towards women in this book, but this is a book about women. The main characters we follow are women. And in order to satirize what's happening, we need to see that violence. So yes, if you were to balance it out, there is more violence towards women in this book and men, but there is violence towards everyone. And also in order to connect with these characters and understand the satire at play, that violence does need to happen. The South Korea that Chon Wan Kwan is satirizing is a violent one, but there is also a lot of beauty in this book. It's subtle because all the other stuff is so in your face, but it is there. Imagine if someone tried to splice together Great Expectations and 100 Years of Solitude and threw in a dash of fable folklore in Korea, and that's this book. Ish, kinda. This book is busting with plot, and I mean busting. There are enough plot threads in this book to fill three books. It feels so much bigger and more epic than its 370 pages. So, that was a pretty long intro. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So what's this book about? We spend most of this book following two women, a mother, Chum Bok, and her daughter, Chum Wee, and the town that they live in, Pondai. We also splinter off constantly into these little subplots, these little stories, but they all lead us back to our two main characters. Most of the characters we meet along the way all get their own backstory, but everything moves at this breakneck pace. At the start, we meet a mute woman called Chum Wee. She has just left prison for arson. She was accused of starting a fire that destroyed the town of Pyondai. The fire was so catastrophic and destroyed so much that pretty much everyone in the town slowly left. Chung Wee is heading back to the Brick Factory. It is a place her mother built. It's the only place she knows, and she spent most of her life there making bricks. She is alone and she has no idea what to do next. We then jump back in time and almost get this lineage, this family history leading up to the present. We meet Chumbok, who is Chum Wee's mother, and she is only young at this point and she has just run away from home in order to find a better life for herself in a bigger town. We do cover quite a lot before we meet Chumbok. I mean, there's a bee lady and her mother, an abusive old woman, but I think I'm just gonna allow you to discover those things for yourself. Upon arriving at this new bigger town, Chumbok decides to start her own fish drying business on the beach. Even at a young age, Chumbok is smart and tenacious and her business is a roaring success. She seems to have this gift for business better than everyone around her and she soon starts to realize the capitalist dream. She also seems to admit this smell that sort of allures men and women to her. 
John Buck falls in love many times throughout this book, but she uses men for the advantages that their gender gives her, in order to keep advancing her businesses and her status. John Buck's fish drying business is destroyed by a storm and she moves on to even more escapades. Again, I'm not going to go into details otherwise, I'm just spoiling things for you. But after a lot of stuff happens, and I mean a lot of stuff, she ends up having a child, Chum Wee, who can't speak. Chung Bok decides to head to Pyeongdae with Chum Wee, and her entrepreneurial spirit revitalizes the town. She starts up her own brick making business, and it is so successful that more and more people keep flooding to the town, more places are built, cafes, bars. It grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. The bricks she builds are so good, they are considered to be the best in the country. Soon, the most important people in the country are flocking to her brickyard for her bricks. Again, I've skipped over a lot of characters, and I mean a lot of characters, who help Chumbok get to this point. But it's these side characters and these little side stories that make this book, so again, I'm not going to ruin those things for you. But Chumbok just gets richer and richer and richer, and she decides to erect this movie theatre in the shape of a whale in the centre of Pyeongdae. And again, people flock from all around the country to just see this monolith, this beautiful building. But wrapped up in all of this success is also a curse. And the theatre, along with the rest of the town, burns down. And as already mentioned, Chung Wee, Chung Bok's daughter, is blamed for this fire that destroyed the theatre in the town and she is sent to prison. The story then shifts to just following Chung Wee, and we follow her time in prison and then back to where we started. In the final section, we follow Chung Wee and what she does after prison, what she gets up to, and I will say that this final section is by far the most moving part of the book. And that's kind of it, but also not even close to what happens in this book. There's literally 60 to 100 side characters and stories that I just haven't told you about. But let's leave all that there and get on to what I liked and what I didn't like. What I liked, pretty much everything. <laughs> I love the pacing, I love the prose. I love this foreshadowing, fably thing the story seems to do. We'll meet a character and then the narrator will say, in 20 days time they will die of XYZ and then we'll jump back to that character and follow them knowing exactly what's going to happen. This book is constantly, all the time, spoiling events that are going to happen or letting you know exactly what's going to happen to its characters and I really loved it for that. I love how the satire was handled throughout this book. It is incredibly funny, really, really funny. And then this kind of realisation hits you and you're really disturbed. And then you start thinking about it even more and it all becomes incredibly sad. And that cycle repeats over and over and over throughout the entirety of this book. I love how bizarre and weird this book is. It is really weird at times, but I kind of loved it. There's this sort of magical realism element to it that almost heightens what you're reading, a way of pushing past the brutality, because I think if that wasn't there, it wasn't including, it would all become a bit too much. I love the structure of this book, the way it's plotted, the way it jumps around, we get these small little stories, we follow side plots, it all leads back to our main characters. I just thought it was structured beautifully, and it kept the pacing moving so, so well. I loved all of the characters, they are all so deeply, and I mean deeply flawed, but they are all byproducts of the environment and culture they've been brought up in. Yet I loved how our characters are trying to push against those traditions, push against that culture and advance themselves. What I didn't like, one thing, there are a couple of moments in this book where it gets a little bit too male gazy. A couple of moments where the description of women was just unnecessary. Now, there are a lot of moments in this book where the descriptions are a little bit off-putting, but they always fit with the satire at play. However, there were two, only two moments whilst reading that I would say I read it and I thought to myself, that wasn't necessary. We didn't need that description. So as I said, loads of moments throughout this book that might make you feel uncomfortable, but they are all in keeping with the theme and the satire of this book. They are. But there were two moments, too, that I just went, mm, we didn't need that. But that's it for dislikes. I absolutely loved everything else. I'm going to give this book five stars out of five. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I really, really hope it wins the International Booker Prize. It won't. I don't think a book like this will. But, but there's a part of me that really hopes because I loved it so much. And to finish things off, I don't think this book is for everyone. I really don't. And I can totally, totally understand people putting this book down at the 50 to 100 page mark. I can understand. You shouldn't. You, you should definitely finish a book before saying what you think about it. I truly believe in that. However, 
you know, I, I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't blame you if you read like 50 to 100 pages and went, no, this isn't for me. Um, so yeah, but I, you know, stick with it. I think there is so much in this book that is really, really, really good. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not, it is just not for everyone. So I don't know whether I can recommend it to you or not. Look back at my past reviews, look at the books that I've enjoyed. And if you've enjoyed those books as well, then definitely give this a go because I'm giving it five stars. It is utterly fantastic. But at the same time, yeah, uh, there's a lot of trigger warnings with this one, a lot of content warnings, and it just might not be for you. So have you read this book? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Please let me know in the comments below. And as always, I hope you're well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.